everyone. I'm Joan Raymond, author and writing coach, and this is A Heart for Writing, where we offer resources and encouragement to writers of all genres at any stage in their writing journey. And today, I am thrilled to have uh, my guest, Barney Salzberg. In case you've not heard of Barney, let me tell you a little bit about him. So Barney has published, um, he's a, he has over 50 picture books published. And he's been traveling the world talking about creativity and where ideas come from. His books have won numerous awards, including Napa Gold Awards, Publishers Weekly, and Kirkus Starred Reviews. His one book, um, beautiful, oops, most recently, Melinda Gates chose this book as one of the top three books every child should read. Barney's latest book is a collaboration with Jamie Lee Curtis. Real life friends Barney Salzberg and Jamie Lee Curtis share their fun, funny, and imagination, imagine, uh, I can't say that word, imaginative creations, encouraging readers to find their own unique perspectives lurking in puddles and noodles and fruit and flowers. So I am going to bring on Barney so we can chat about his books. Hi, Barney. Hi, Joan. Nice to see you. <laughs> How are you doing? Okay. So since this is a harder writing, I love to ask, I know you're an author and an illustrator. Um, so let me just ask you, when did you first discover your heart for writing and illustrating? Hmm. So funny because I'm working on a dedication for a book that I just finished the art and I am um, really considering ded dedicating my book to two of my teachers. One was a fifth grade teacher, one was an eighth grade teacher. And my uh, eighth grade teacher said to me, uh, your grammar is atrocious and your, your spelling is terrible, but I love your ideas. <laughs> and my fifth grade teacher, I realized as an adult saved me by having me on Thursday afternoons, the day before our spelling test, he would hand me the list of words, which I could never spell, and have me make up a story in front of the class off the top of my head using the spelling list. Interesting. It occurred to me as an adult that he was trying to find some way for me to feel good about myself because it wasn't going to happen for my test score. <laughs> so, I don't know that I recognized that I was a storyteller. Um, and really, even after I published my first book, I don't know that I knew I was a storyteller. Uh, it took a, a little while. That Interesting. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. There wasn't this aha moment of I'm a storyteller. It sort of <laughs> actually happened. I just started doing it and huh. kind of grew into it. That's interesting. So what? Um, what comes first, the images or the words? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I've come full circle. There's no no one way to work. Um, literally, when I took my first children's book writing class, was writing an illustration. I was so uh, uh, apprehensive to try to write that I drew my first book without any words and sat with my teacher, and who Barbara Botner, who's grandfathered in, so, or grandmothered in, would you say? Uh, so many people from Laura Numeroff to Lane Smith, just Peggy Rathman, great writer. She sat with me at her K-Pro word processor, that's how old we are, and, <laughs> uh, and I told her the story and she typed it out. Um, I have found at times, I'm. There are times when I would go hand in hand, a little bit of drawing, a little bit of writing. Um, there'd be times when I'd be stuck on a story and I'd start noodling with the characters. And if you're open, you might recognize a position of a character that might suggest something that I might not have thought of had I not been drawing. So that might start playing into the storyline. Um, it, it it there isn't there isn't a formula for me. Um, hmm. I, I now have probably gone to the other extreme where I write out most of my stories. But oops, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. uh, is a story that I couldn't have sat down and written out. I needed to play with paper, and that's a process I refer to as thinking with your hands. So right. sometimes I have to just get in there and play, and they go. It's a it's a back and forth mishmash. How's that? <laughs> yeah, and and so people have different learning styles. Would you say that you're audio visual kinesthetic? I mean, it sounds like you are definitely hands on. Got to touch it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, we were just doing something. I, I was building something for a friend, uh, putting together a, uh, a hammock in, in Sonoma County, and um, I didn't look at the manual. I looked at the picture. Right. And I had to build it. 
But yeah, to read the manual, my comprehension skills. And my mom was a reading and study skills counselor at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where I'd be without her, but uh, I definitely kinesthetic and, and visual and audio. audio. Yeah. Right. It's interesting because I, I, I read a lot, but if someone were to read the directions on how to play a game, it's like, that means nothing to me. Just play the game and show me. I'll pick it up right now. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I need to see it. Yeah. Um, ideas. Too many or not enough? You know, I always talk to kids about that. I say, you know, where do ideas come from? Is there any place you can't get an idea? And then I would make up this fictitious door. I actually had a picture of it. I re uh, photoshopped Toys R Us, which is no longer, and made it Ideas R Us, like you can go in and buy an idea. <laughs> I'm constantly getting ideas. Uh, it drove my kids crazy when they were little because anything they said, I would. That's a good name for a book, or you know, that's a good name for a song. And Dad, you know. Um, but that initial spark of maybe there's something here. And the finished product, if you're, we're talking to writers here, whole other Oprah, oh, yeah. to say, you know, uh, uh, really fleshing it out and, and digging in. I'm quick at, yeah, I could give me a line. I'll make a song. It, is it going to be a good song? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. But your, your head's just always got something going. Always. You know? Always. always yeah. Um, and how do you decide on the story that needs to be written right now? I mean, if you got ideas and yeah. notebooks and, you know, having done this for as long as I have, um, I have two voices in my head. One is a story nags at me and I need to finish it for the sake of finishing it. I had a, um, a, a band always. And in high school, my, my um, we had a producer managing us. And he said, if you're working on a song, and I attribute this to the same as a story, and you kind of think it's terrible, finish it. He said, because if you don't, it's going to show up somewhere else in another song. So I've kind of taken that idea of, all right, this story is kind of terrible, but I'm going to, maybe maybe if I continue working on it, I might be able to turn it into something I hadn't expected, but just to kind of complete it. So that's done. Um, but I'm I'm more um, selective as to what I put my my time into now, really because I've done this long enough to know that it's got to resonate with people it's got to have i could write a story about a broccoli looking for a friend well that would actually be a story because there's a there's a compassionate theme there right. but you know to do something just for the sake of doing it i don't need to spend my time doing that anymore and i'm not into a huge marketing thing because i'm terrible at marketing but <laughs> thinking about um I don't know, I could blow this out of the water because the story I'm submitting right now, I'm calling a cross between Waiting for Godot and the old movie, My Dinner with Andre for Children, which is a <laughs> terrible pitch setup. Uh, but I needed to write it and I, I don't know if it'll find an audience. So I think I can't really worry about it. I just need to follow what keeps coming back and going, I'm thinking about this story, I'm gonna keep working on it. Mm -hmm. So so you talked about that you're submitting a story. Um, so, I mean, rejections. Let's talk rejections for a while, because you are traditionally published. You are not self-published, so you have to send it out there into the world and hope someone says yes. So weird thing. Yeah, it is. I, so, I, I, so my question is, how did you deal with rejections in the very beginning compared to how do you deal with them now? Do they still hurt or? Oh, I love them. No, um, I was, you know. <laughs> The first two books that I sold, one was called It Must Have Been the Wind, which was to Harper. And when it was Harper in a row, um, my teacher, Barbara Botner, took it to New York. She was working with an editor and called me from New York saying she wants to publish this. Now, that said, we spent a year working on it and they gave it back. So wow. I had to do some fancy footwork. The yeah. second book I sold was a book of cartoons called Utter Nonsense. And I was told that you can't do this. And this was in the 70s. But I literally walked into a 50-story building in New York and sold it wow. like, in 10 minutes. You couldn't do it then. You can't even get it in the building now without yeah. ID. But So I'm, um, I, I didn't have rejection right away. The first time it happened, I didn't love it. Um, and it doesn't <laughs> get any better. 
<laughs> what I've learned is once you have an editor, hopefully they're, they're, they're your person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up in a period where Harper did Shel Silverstein and Maurice Sendak and all the classic books were done. Ursula Nordstrom was the, the grandmother of the modern children's picture book mm -hmm. and she was publishing them all. And I was really hoping that that was going to be my house. It's become a, a different landscape now and, and editors change houses and we have to follow them or if we want to make a living, and I try to publish two books a year, it usually requires going to more than one house. So sometimes it's going, I send a manuscript to an editor I've worked with, and hopefully they know me well enough to say, I see something here and let's work on it. But I'm finding that that attitude is really disappearing. Um, I think they're so overworked and underpaid and overwhelmed uh, that, and this is before the pandemic, just mm -hmm. had that on steroids. Um, Editors don't seem to have quite the amount of time they used to to help you develop. And I get a more of a thumbs up or thumbs down. And that's really hard for me. Yeah. I got a beautiful rejection recently. And they said so many positive things, but they felt that it wasn't, at the end, didn't work for them. And I thought, well, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. So finding that person. And I always tell my students when I taught, take your ego, put it in a shoebox, bury it in a yard. <laughs> take it personally. You just yeah. Yeah. And it's hard not to take it personally, especially when you think this is the one that's really going to resonate with people or whatever. And then they're like, eh, no, thank you. It happens and it happens and it happens. I always give the example, Laura Numeroff, uh, who wrote, if you give a mouse a cookie, mm -hmm. had it rejected nine times. Wow. Okay. And um, it was rejected once by Harper. Another editor at Harper bought it. And then wow. Kate Camillo, I think her number is 460 times her Jeez. first story. Win Dixie. And know you know, that. that takes a lot of tenacity to keep, you know, after a while, you're just going to be like, forget it, you know. We all feel like someone should be knocking on our door because they got wind that we're talented. And my gosh, this is going to be not only a book, but a movie. And there's going to be a theme park and toys. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're going to have a day. And, you know, I mean, I know you're in the LA area, but you're going to get a star on, you know, Hollywood, you know, fame, Walk of Fame or I something. About that. Maybe we yeah. need a new street for children. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we should. I think we should. <laughs> um, imposter syndrome. Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? I never heard that. You know, really, imposter syndrome is like when um, you've like, OK, so I've published three books. You've done 50. I should be like, oh, my gosh, he's not even going to talk to me because I'm a nobody. You know, that type of thing. Um, there's a lot of authors. There's a lot of illustrators that just feel. I have the sort of the dyslexic version of, of that. Like I'll go to a conference and they're like, "Who are you?" <laughs> I'm the guy that did, you know, like you know, there's a lot of young, you know, really talented new guys, and I'm clearly on the old side. Like you're still writing, yeah. <laughs> or who are you? Or could you get me a drink? <laughs> like, exactly. Oh, yeah. I don't work here. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't feel like that. I, I earned this and. No, I think what I my initial thought when you said imposter is sometimes and I think it's really common because the Beatles did it with Buddy Holly. I mean, you you feel like you're borrowing from someone else and, and that ultimately gets integrated into what I do, what one does. Mm -hmm. But I think there are times when I go, God, I just ripped that book or that concept or that, you know, that imposter more than I don't, you know, deserve so it. Yeah. No. No, I, Actually, I, I want that star on that street we haven't figured out. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll start a petition. Yeah. Um, so, well, there's no new ideas. What is it? Shakespeare had most of the new ideas and he used yeah. them. But So let's talk about beautiful oops. I'm going to put the picture up. Um, I love that you call it oops. I call it oops, but this is oh, fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, up. it's oops. Oops, yeah. So this book is amazing. I have a copy of it, a signed copy, actually, that I got when I met you in person. Mm -hmm. And um, talk about this book a little bit. It's, you know, I should have pulled it out, but I, I I do so many talks about this book. I usually have them on hand, but you can use your imagination. This really hatched from teachers. Uh, and before the pandemic, I traveled an, a, an extraordinary amount all over the world, uh, speaking at 
any 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 place that would have me. And um, two of the images in my PowerPoint were one I spilled a cup of coffee on a sketchbook, and there was a stain, mm -hmm. and uh, I was not happy about that stain. But when it dried, I drew with a sharpie and turned that stain into a monster. And then I was out in this studio. Uh, it was a different configuration. There was a window over my desk at the time. And uh, my son locked a dog in here. And I was working on a collage for a book called The Flying Garbanzos. And it's really painstaking cutting. And I literally used uh, uh, tweezers to put some of the pieces down and, and very labor intensive. And the dog tried to climb out of the window. I climbed up onto my desk and stepped all over my picture. And uh, I couldn't erase the paw prints. And I kept staring at it going, I can't believe I have to start over. And then some something clicked and I covered each paw print with a cloud. And that composition would have never happened had the dog not stepped on my piece. So those images of the stain and the paw prints were in my presentation and teachers just everywhere I went said, can you teach this? And um, I was in the studio one day and I tore a piece of paper part way across and went, oh my goodness, I can, I can make a talk. <laughs> it's a mouth. And I thought this would be amazing. What, what, like it's, I got to go on a messy scavenger hunt and what could I mess up, spill, tear, smears, whatever, and, and turn into something. And right. um, my, we brought it to, I built it. This, this actually, I'm looking to see if it happens to be nearby. It's not. Um, but the, I built the, the book. This is not something you could just describe. People had to feel this. Mm -hmm. And um, the editor at Workman that I had done one book with, I literally sat with her and she looked at it when I, I, we're publishing this. That editor is R.J. Polacco, who wrote Wonder. Wow. And has, has the most intuitive editor I'd ever worked with in my life. And just got this and took what my seed of an idea was and blew it up into something. And Jamie Lee Curtis happened to be here and saw the dummy, mm -hmm. the working book, right. and said, this book's going to change your life. And when I told my editor that, she says two things. One, would she write a blurb on the book, a little thing on the front, and would she be my best friend? <laughs> I looked at her and I said, this is the worst question to ask you, and please don't take it the wrong way, but would you be open to writing a little thing? And she, like, in 30 seconds texted me. Yeah, thing on the front, and I do think it helped. You can't really read it here. You can't read it. Everyone who's ever uh, used the word "oops,", oops. we yeah. yeah. By the, anyway, so the point is, I do think it helped put this book on the map in a different way, and it's mm -hmm. now been out for eleven years, and it goes up in sales every year, which doesn't happen. How many really? languages? I know you've said it's in several languages. I don't. Things. Think more than it's in um, English, uh, uh, Chinese, and uh, Japanese, I think, and Korean. It's really expensive when you do a book like this, and they have to change the plate to when they're printing to um, to make it in another language. And I mm -hmm. think their minimum is 40,000 copies. Wow. So um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. When I, my, about a Six months before the pandemic, I did a 14-day tour of China because they bought the book and reprinted it. But they did all the 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 um, translations in colors like the original book because they're printing it there and they could afford to do it. But it's really cost costly to do. And I feel bad I don't have the book right in front of me, and I don't want to get up, you know, right now. But it's it's an interactive book. I mean, yeah. it's it's not just printed on pages. You open it and you flip something over. Because you see what it was, and then, and I was fortunate to take um, your webinar for adults, where I remember we crumpled a Kleenex or we sneezed into a Kleenex. <laughs> did some, I can't remember what. I mean, not a real sneeze, but yeah. I mean, you were talking about how anything can be a mistake, but it can be made. And you know, we had to tear paper and we made up stories. And even for us adults, um, you know, I. I dabble with art. I, I love to do some painting. Did you find and that intimidating or was it liberating? Or both? It, was, it was actually, it was intimidating because there was other people watching. And that's where I felt the imposter syndrome. It's like, oh my gosh, all these other people are amazing illustrators and stuff. And I, you know, I'm not. But what I found is that all of us, when we tore that piece of paper, it sparked something in 
well, my imagination, their imagination, and we all had a different story just from this torn piece of paper. It was suddenly a bird or a frog or, right. you know. Well, what, it, I, what I love about it, and I've learned this in going to schools, because by the time you get a fourth grade class coming into a, an auditorium or mm -hmm. a library, their arms are folded, you know. They're, they're developmentally at a different place, as opposed to a kindergartner that's going to make a scribble scrabble and tell you it's whatever it is. <laughs> It just happens developmentally that kids look around the room and know that one kid has become the artist and they're getting all the strokes and kudos for being that artist. And it's, it can be incredibly intimidating for a lot of people because why bother right. that person? What I like about um, squiggles and spills and oopses is it levels the playing field a bit. You don't have to be an incredible artist or to draw realistically or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, and I and I find that it's it's once some people, mostly adults, who have this initial kind of they're a little intimidated, they have fun, and that's really what this is about to open yeah. that up. It was definitely fun, and it was like, wow, I didn't realize I could make something out of a torn piece of paper. <laughs> well, <feel> good. <laughs> so let's talk about your um, latest book. This yeah. is the one, and this is an actual. Um, collaboration with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis where yeah. tell us uh, how this how this book came apart uh, came about <laughs> well, you became Canadian for a minute um, <laughs> Jamie started uh, texting me once she saw what I could do with oops um, on a regular basis she would just she loves taking pictures with her phone and seems to take a lot of pictures of the ground we're looking down like that's a seashell obviously <laughs> I'm assuming it was on the ground unless she was in a really weird beach where the sand was sideways and um <laughs> And I would drop everything, and I've got my little iPad with a pencil on it, and mm -hmm. I would run to take that image and play with it and send it back. And this became a dance between us. Um, she, We were doing an interview after the book came out, and she says, it's adult flirting. And I thought, it is? I, I didn't know that. <laughs> but... We, I mean, even after the books come out, I get one probably at least once a week, maybe a, one, once every other week. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really fun thing to do. And I've thought about sending her a picture to see if she would draw on it, but I haven't tried that yet. Oh, I think uh, you should. I think you should. She, um, she's the one that suggests we do it as a book. What's crazy is no one wanted to publish the book. Uh, Jamie's got, obviously, a, a, a very well-known name um, as an actor. And as a children's book writer, but she was a writer, and people were not pleased that it wasn't written by Jamie. And they were saying, well, can we say that she wrote it? Like, no, I wrote it. And we actually pitched it initially as just by both of us. We didn't delineate. But um, it took a really long time. And Creston Publishing is out of San Francisco, and it's a teeny tiny house. Marissa Moss, who did Amelia's Notebook way back in the day, um, God bless her for, for seeing the potential here. Also a really brilliant editor, but she took a chance on it, and, and I'm really grateful. And, so, and even so, that just shows that even if you're a big name and you've got a lot of books behind you, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to love it, even though you two were just passionate about this. And I, you know, on your Facebook page, I've seen you post new pictures of her, uh, you know, new drawings that she sent you a picture of a crack in the you know, sidewalk or something. So anyway, that's awesome. Um, I've asked Barney to read one of his books. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put you full screen. So okay. you, you are front and center. There you go. Thank you. All right. So I, what I brought was, um, I didn't really bring it. I'm, I'm here. Um, um, one of these <laughs> is not like the other. I'm going to get car sick looking at this. And this was inspired by the Sesame Street song, video bit that they would do. And it used to really bother me because they'd say, one of these is not like the other. They'd show three noodles and a shoe. Well, duh. Yes, one of these is not like the other. But what they would follow it with was, one of these does not belong. And I always felt bad for the one, the shoe in this case, um, that didn't belong. And I thought, well, why couldn't they be connected some way? And that's really the, the seed that inspired this. If this is not Where's Waldo, you will not be wondering which one's different. Okay, so one of these is not like the other. And we have the opening. 
and it was dedicated to Rabbi Mark and Harriet, who have created a community that embraces everyone who walks through the door. These are people I met in Los Angeles, and I felt like they embrace, so there would be no singling out who's different. One of these is not like the other. And that's just fine with us. One of these is not like the others. But we can still be friends. One of these is not like the others. You know, I'm going to just point something out. As an illustrator, these are pretty much the same pig. But if you look at the eyes in the middle one, it changes everything. I, I like to look at things like that. So one of these is not like the other. And this wolf looks pretty happy about it. And that's the way we rock. And I decided they could be in a band together. And it's called Oink. One of these is not like the others. And that's the way we roll. And I always tell kids, wear a helmet. It was hard to shove those ears in one. One of these is not like the others. Oh, and that's the way we fly. Snails and aliens look a lot alike and you can't see the bottoms. One of these is not like the others. Because you can never have too many hats. One of these is not like the others. What a nice surprise. One of these is not like the others. And the other three were delicious. He's a pie monster, in case you can't tell. Some of us are a little different. And that's the way we like it. And yes, I drew every piece of confetti. Oh, there, everybody's on the bottom now. Sorry, my hands. And at the end, they're kind of parading off the page. And so at the front, we had three penguins and a panda. And what could unite them? A story, oh. which is Hold on. Hold, keep that up. I just, OK, yeah. there you go. Right. So. There is a board book version of this. They took out two spreads. They took out the uh, pie monster and the, the hats and the fish. So if you get this book and go, where are they? They're in the picture book, not the board book. They have uh, page limitations. And I thought they were a little too esoteric for, for, for people who would read a board book. Yeah, uh, our granddaughter is almost three, so we get a lot of board books right now. <laughs> She's not, not good for the uh, tear the pages, but... Um... Well, authors like that because they tear the pages and they have to buy another one. Oh, well, that's I, true. We we keep you we keep you in business, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so wait, can we? You haven't asked this question. Oh. But for people who are wondering, like, how is this? Because kids kids always say, "Are you rich?" You know, when I go to a school and I go, "Well, money wise," I said, "I'm rich in that I get to do what I love to do for work, and that's huge." Mm -hmm. I don't, there's no price on this book for some reason. I think this is an $18 book, which is crazy. Yeah. Because I write and because I illustrate, I make all the, the profits on that. So I would ask a kid, what, you know, what do you think I make on an $18 book? And they go, like, my favorite answer was a kid that said $30. <laughs> Someone who does math like me, um, they range in, in, in responses, but it's as the writer and illustrator, it's $1.80. And then my agent takes out on top of that. So you need to sell a lot of books to make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. And I always say, don't give up your day job until they've made that movie of your book. But um, <laughs> that's just why I try to do two books a year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't, I wasn't going to ask, well, I didn't 
ask that right now, but I, I know that um, traditionally published, you know, people think, oh man, those books are really expensive. They're making bucks. But I mean, now beautiful, oh, oops. <laughs> I make less on oops. But that one sold, you told us once, I remember how many copies that sold. It was about 600,000 copies, but it's way, way, way less than 10%. Right. Because it's, right. uh, it's uh, usually the, the um, after the first edition, if you, whatever your advance is, that covers all the books in the first edition. If it goes in the second printing, you start making money on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, because all the plates are done and, and the costs are, are pretty much, although paper prices have changed. Uh, because Oops is a labor intensive book to build, their costs are always high and, mm -hmm. and they pay, it's under a dollar, I'll just tell you that. And, yeah. You know, 600,000 is not bad, but it's, we're talking over 11 years now. Yeah. So it's spread out. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, writers, they do it because we do it because we're passionate about what we do. You know. Yeah, but there is always, and I still have it, like, you know, that little inkling of, well, this book, you know, this, this will be it. Yeah. 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 But that, this will the, be the, that, the, the, the give the mouse a cookie book. That'll be, you know, one of those. But. Yeah. When, when Laura bought this house in the hills in Brentwood in LA, my mom called it the house that mouse built. <laughs> that's a different. That's not normal. That's not normal. Um, uh it, it's an interesting thing i i don't go to las vegas you know i'm not a gambler but i think about the fine line between being built being brilliant being the village idiot and it can get blurry you know it's like i keep going well this is the book this is the book the phenomenon and and i know i'm adding to what you're talking about here but unless you've got incredible social media chops and a huge following publishers do somewhat of, of, a, of a promotion, but there's not the budget for it. And to pay a PR firm to do it, it's usually more than what your advance on the book is. Uh, because I did the book with Jamie Lee Curtis, um, I did bring in a PR firm and they did get us on Good Morning America. And I watched the sales on Amazon, which I try not to shop for on books because I like to support my local bookstores, but the numbers jumped hugely. I mean, for two days. And then mm -hmm. they slowly went back to what they were. Right. And um, you don't get to use a movie star on every book. So it's you have to really be creative in finding places to go speak and 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 communities to reach and, and to find book your Book signings, school visits. I mean, but school it's, visits, you're not selling to the parents. You know, it's, the kids are there. So, yeah. you know, it's definitely getting your face out there. And I know during the pandemic, one thing that was, what was cool is that you went live pretty much every day for a while and you read yeah. a book, you played music and, you know, um, that was yeah, comforting. It lasted too long. I thought I was going to be able to like write it out with a book every, I haven't written that many books, <laughs> uh, other people's books. And yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I use Instagram and I use Facebook and try to be engaging. It's interesting mm -hmm. though. Last week, Jamie sent me a picture and I drew on it. And I think I had, I don't know, whatever there was, 100 likes. And she had 6,000 the last time I looked. <laughs> the <same laughs> thing. We were sharing the same thing. But she's got a little larger pool to pick from. Right, right. So even though this is kind of, it, it sounds like a downer um, for new authors, but what advice um, would you give to beginning writers? In other words, is this worth it? Is it worth pursuing these ideas and making them? You know, that's that's such a, a personal choice. Um, you know, it's it's no different than watching America's Got Talent and seeing how many people want it and how many people are hoping it's going to change their lives and and how many talented people there are out there. You know, it's it's. Um, you know, there's a, a line, Jackson Brown, and if your lis listeners, followers are a lot younger, they won't know who he is, but he's one of my favorite songwriters, talks about trying, the, the song Running on Empty says, try not to confuse what you love with what you do to survive. And I was given advice by my ophthalmologist in the 12th grade who asked me what I was going to do with my life. And I told him I was going to be a Beatle. I was going to be a musician. <laughs> and he said, find something that you can do 
to support yourself in a, in a way that makes you comfortable and do your art on the side. And I realized he was a sculptor and a photographer and this artist, but he had a really good paying job. I, as most teenagers was like, ah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be able to make it on my own. And, and it's mm -hmm. been a rough ride. I mean, I was a singing waiter for years. I worked in a sh factory designing sweatshirts. I sold shoe leather. It wasn't like I decided to sell a book. And when I sold my first book, I could then quit my other job. So it was a lot of side jobs. And mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, the reality is I quit working for other people when my son was born and he turned 32 last week. But I also am married to an attorney. And it does help to have a <laughs> regular paycheck in the family because my right. career can be you know, so to tell someone yes or no, I'm not going to ever do that. Um, you have to follow what, what feels right for you. Mm -hmm. you really do. And if you need to write, write. I mean, there's nothing saying you can't. And, you know, too many times people are like, yeah, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to write all day. And honestly, I can't. I mean, for me, even I can't write all day. I'm sure you can't illustrate all day. It's just it's almost easier when you have something else going on and you know, okay, I only have two hours to get to work on this. Well, and yeah, I mentor these uh, writers and last night we had a Zoom and one's a teacher and she was saying that, you know, she just doesn't have the time right now to write. And that's like Raquel, RJ Polacco, when I was visiting her, when I just thought she was an, just an editor at that time. I was at her house in Brooklyn and, um, she showed me a closet in her hall where she had a little desk and a chair. And she said, oh, I wrote a book in there. I was like, what? She goes, yeah. I said, when did you have time? She was actually running the art department and being an editor. She was doing two people's job and she was raising two kids. She said she would put the kids to bed, go to sleep and set her alarm and work from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. She did it for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the writing a book like Wonder is a one in a million chances that's going to happen. But she carved out a time. And when I worked for my father selling shoe leather, I worked till two in the morning on my first book every night. I didn't have much of a social life, but you find time. Right. You Kate to Camillo in this interview, you can find her on YouTube talking about her career, said she dressed up in black, black clothes. She wore a black turtleneck and drank coffee for 10 years, calling herself a writer and realized she hadn't written anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> And that's just it. You have to put the time. You know, I, I talk to people all the time in my writer coaching and they're like, I don't have the time. It's like we all have 24 hours. It's what's important. What's important to you, you will make the time for. You know, I, I carry this iPad with me. I write in it. I draw in it. If I'm waiting at the doctor's office, if I'm sitting in the chair for them to come in and take my blood pressure, I'm drawing, writing. It also gets a great conversation starter. What, what are you drawing that dog? You know, this is what I do. Right. Um, Airplanes. Uh, uh, I used to draw. I used to pick the kids up. I'm the, the the primary parent at home with my wife at a, at a regular job, and I would um, write in car line when I would pick them up after school. If I took them to soccer, I I even set up my van. I would do watercolors in the back, you know, while I was waiting for them to do stuff. And you make time if it's if it's that important, and you sleep less. Yeah, life is short. For me, when I'm writing, I can't sleep anyway because my characters keep me awake. So, you know, I, I, they're like, rude. yeah, well, you know, the 5 a.m. wake up call. It's like, get, get, you know, we got to talk to you. And I'm like, OK, whatever. So do you ever have that time where like you think you've got a great idea in the middle of the night and then you write it down in the morning? You go, what? What? I can't, I can't read my writing. I love the type you can type now. But. Well, I have sticky notes. And then my big thing is I'll write it down and I'll look at it and it's like, Oh man, I already had a note on top of it. So I'm like, it's like a double note and I have no idea. And it's like, well, I guess it's gone now. So <laughs> I, I use that time just as I fall asleep. Whatever I'm working on, I think about it for that mm -hmm. moment. I usually fall asleep too fast to remember, but sometimes I will wake up and I ha will have been dreaming about it and I will make notes. That's but awesome. I don't have to be possessed that way or this. You know. I had the ending of a book come to me that way. I, it was a, a mystery, and I woke up at 5 a.m., and it was right there. Because the, I, I, I don't plan my books. I just write. So I don't even know who the killer is until, like, the second or third chapter to the end. And it was it came to me, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. But, you know, I had to go well, That's the beauty of this. You know, characters tell you. Yes. Uh, um, you know the Paul McCartney woke up singing the melody for yesterday. Wow. But the lyrics... 
that he was singing instead of yesterday. Mm -hmm. he, he woke up singing scrambled eggs. <laughs> Can't have made it work. <laughs> That's awesome. Anyway, Barney, thank you so much. Um, this has been so much fun. And um, I, in the description of this um, broadcast, there'll be all the information on how to find Barney, his website, his Instagram, his Facebook, and all that good stuff. There's a book and, title, How to Find Barney. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, oh, there you go. A next book, How to Find Barney. <laughs> so, thanks, for anyway, having me. thanks, Barney. Um, anyway, you can also find out more about me and the services I offer to writers. Um, including a seven-day um, uh, video series, Overcoming Blank Page Syndrome. So if you can't think of an idea, um, this is a free, it's a free series, and there's a link to that too. Thank you again to Barney, um, and thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.